All right, welcome to this webinar for budgetary estimating for water and wastewater facility improvements, specifically to support your project uh, with the WEF Student Design Competition. My name is Frederick Tack. I'm an associate with GHD. I'm a licensed civil engineer and certified uh, grade four water and wastewater treatment plant operator. Uh, GHD is an international company um, practicing all disciplines of engineering across the globe. And here in Arizona, we focus on water and wastewater. And I'll be presenting today on the engineering perspective to budgetary estimating. And I'm Darren Roll. I'm with Kiwit Infrastructure West Co. We're a general contractor and designer based out of Omaha, Nebraska, focusing on engineering, infrastructure, and building sector work. We uh, have operating projects in the U.S., Canada, and Mexico. My role is I sponsor the water and wastewater business for Keywood Infrastructure West Co. Today I will be presenting on the contractor's perspective with budgetary estimating of water and wastewater facilities. So here's what we're going to cover today. We'll talk about cost management, different types of costs and estimating. We'll have a discussion on accuracy and contingency. And then we'll jump right into the engineering perspective followed by the contractor's perspective, and ultimately some conclusions and recommendations. The learning objectives for this webinar is to first understand the processes involved in budgetary estimating to help you prepare a cost estimate and budget to support decision making. Second, how to understand and complete a rough order of magnitude estimate for your project. And three, to gain perspectives of the difference and commonalities between engineers and contractors and their approach to estimating and how both of these should help you improve your estimate. First, we want to talk a little bit about cost management. Overall for a project, what goes into that? Well, there's three key features. There's cost estimating, cost budgeting, and cost control. Of those tools, we're going to be focusing on the cost estimating today, specifically so that you can compare and select alternatives uh, considering cost, to add confidence in your selection of the recommended alternative, and three, demonstrate the feasibility of the project. The big picture with cost management is as the project continues through its life cycle, your ability to influence cost exponentially reduces. That means your best chance to set the budget properly and, have, and influence it is during that conceptual design and planning. As you move through detailed design, procurement, and then the construction, you start to reduce that capacity to change the cost. And by the time you reach startup, that project cost is over. So there's three types of costs we um, need to make sure you're aware of. First, there's the direct costs. Those are costs that can be directly related uh, to producing the project, such as labor, materials, components, equipment, engineering, et cetera. Um, so typically in a cost estimate, you may find a quote for a piece of equipment, but just that piece of equipment is not enough. All those other items need to be considered, all those direct costs. Additionally, there's indirect costs to the project uh, that should be accounted for, specifically when you're budgeting. That may be power, consumables, there's overhead, administration, utilities, taxes, insurance. Those all roll into the project costs. And the third type of cost is sunk cost, uh, which may will not be part of your estimate, but to be aware, it's the cost that's already been spent on the project and cannot be recovered. The reason why this is important to note is because continuing to fund a failed project or a project that has great sunk cost um, may not be a valid way to decide on which projects to fund in the future, and sunk costs should be forgotten. Another type of cost is the long-term operations and maintenance cost. So a budgetary estimate to uh, fund and build a project will be that capital estimate. What is the amount of upfront money it will take to deliver the project? But part of deciding whether the project's valid to complete 
uh, should entail looking at that long-term cost. So here's a list of just the minimal items that I would consider for that long-term cost. First, the energy requirements. Second, the chemical and other consumables, like polymer. Um, third would be disposal costs. Are we generating more solids? Are there other materials that have to be disposed of? Uh, next is labor costs. That's the cost of the operator, first to operate the facility and two to maintain it. Uh, different types of technology or implementation and configuration of your project may have lower capital costs but much higher long-term operations costs. And it would be valid for you to develop and show that in your consideration in your estimate. So here are three general types of estimating. Um, first is a rough order of magnitude. It's got about a plus or minus 50% accuracy. It's also referred to as a ballpark estimate, and it's used when time and information is scarce. Um, and typically, that's at the beginning of a project when you're budgeting it. Um, it's used by project managers and decision makers on deciding how and when to move forward with projects. Um, so in, as an example, a uh, rough order of magnitude estimate that was $100,000 means that it could range between $50,000 to $200,000. And uh, special considerations, if there's a lot of uh, electrical instrumentation uh, type technology, that range could be even larger. Now further on in the project, you could do a comparative estimate. That would have an accuracy between 10 and 25%. And in there, uh, some assumptions on historical data could be used, uh, but there would be specific estimates developed during design. And in that example, a comparative estimate of $100,000 would range between 90 to 125. And then finally, a definitive estimate. That should be about plus or minus 5% accuracy and typically would be done at the completion of the design and typically with support from the contractor. So for this project, uh, we're going to talk about today completing a rough order of magnitude estimate. Frederick, if I can jump in here real quick. From a contractor's perspective, the rough order of magnitude estimate is something that we use a lot of times to help our clients understand the direction that their project design is heading in. A lot of those requests for rough order of magnitude or conceptual estimates are verbal, and they typically will come in concert with a design meeting looking for ranges to determine which direction to go with the treatment system or a grading program for a site or site development or what type of equipment to select. So it's good to, to have some familiarity, familiarity with the conceptual or rough order magnitude design process from a contractor's perspective. And that's a great point. That'll be highly um, uh, specific for this project as you're using this rough order of magnitude estimate to make decisions and validate your approach. So accuracy and contingency, it's good to understand and it's good to have. First, regarding accuracy, you're going to want to be consistent on your methodology and approach and references um, as applicable to your different uh, systems and alternatives. Your estimate is not going to be precise. With limited time and information, we're not getting to that comparative or definitive level. But you should aim to be accurate, complete, and thorough in your estimate. First, you're going to want to organize your estimate by major system area, such as dewatering or digestion or headworks. Then break it down into individual components or processes, such as the blowers, aerators, dewatering, or odor control. There should be at least one level of contingency applied to the overall project cost, and that should be roughly between 20 to 35% for this project. Contingency is not about covering the errors in your estimating, but it's about uncovering unknowns and unforeseeable challenges in the future. If site condition changes, if material condition changes, market availability, labor, materials, um, that's what the contingency is for. And all of this is to avoid overruns on bid opening day. So, as I just mentioned, there are various reasons of unknowns and unforeseeable challenges that can happen. And if there's not some contingency for that, uh, the engineer's estimate can end up being the low bid on bid opening day, which no one wants. All right, so jumping into the engineering perspective. 
So we started about, uh, we mentioned starting at the process level, uh, system level. So that's where we want to start to break off your proposed improvements and upgrades for your project. And then we want to proceed through what we call a component by component approach. And that's just listing the summation of the individual elements by their type, their quantity, and what units we're applying to them. Typical units you may see in this type of estimate include linear feet, each area, volume, or lump sum. And lump sum would be where we're not going to break out all the individual components for a system, say electrical um, or uh, some sort of telemetry or something that you can't easily quantify or have the time to quantify, and we'll call that as lump sum. So here's an example to walk you through. Uh, it's a new headworks that's proposed at a wastewater treatment plant, and there are certain components that are in that development. First is a new mechanical screen. So that's a device that we reached out to a, uh, a vendor and we're provided a quote and some information on it. So that will be included in the estimate. Next, we're relocating a manual screen. We're relocating an auger. There's the new concrete pad and uh, box or vault for this new headworks. There's an existing pipe underneath that headworks that will have to be removed. And also, because there's mechanical rotating equipment, that means there's going to be new electrical power supply. So those are all the items for this estimate that I would start to list out. Now, it's not as easy as just listing the item and what that equipment cost is, and we'll walk through that. So here, just as an example, I've listed what those items are. I've numbered them. I've identified some sort of quantity and some sort of unit for each of those quantities. Now, look, in addition, there are a couple other things I added. One was new hand railing, as in that drawing, we showed some handrail going around and some grading over the openings. So I'm capturing the components that I visualize will be there. So um, if you're fortunate enough to get some product information of whatever your proposed uh, improvements are from a vendor, uh, you should be able to capture what those dimensions are. And you need to be aware that there's a horizontal and vertical component um, uh, potentially to your improvements. And for the purpose of that, uh, the vendor information and dimensions have very precise dimensions. For example, the height above the container is six foot five and three eighths inches. And the um, uh, you know, overall depth is 10 foot six and three eight inches. For the purpose of this estimate, I'd be rounding these figures up. It's seven feet above grade. It's 11 feet in total height. We want to just visualize and capture some of that information. Likewise, with um, the pad, the horizontal condition, um, although you're not going to be going through and drawing, developing detailed drawings and dimensions for these improvements, overall, you can conceptualize what that footprint should be. One thing you sh should consider is when you have uh, equipment that you will need to maintain, you should be providing at least three feet around two sides of the equipment for them to operate and maintain it. So uh, that's why there's plenty of room on both ends of this headworks for them to be able to work. Um, so in this example for dimensions, I rounded up from 16 foot three inches long to 17 feet from eight foot eight inches wide to nine feet. You could even round it up to 20 feet by 10 feet. So where do you get some of this information for costs? So here's a list. Um, RS means in BNI Building News, these are um, proprietary manuals that have cost estimate by unit for the type of improvement you'll have, including concrete, reinforcement, formwork, uh, piping, valves, uh, the different things that you'll need. Now, it's possible that some of your sponsors may be able to help you with this, otherwise, uh, there's other ways to capture this information. Uh, first, when it comes to equipment, uh, it's possible to get free quotes from vendors, and that's just a budgetary estimate, um, if it was a type of screen or aerator or, or blower. Uh, the EPA also has a lot of free information regarding cost for wastewater treatment plan and processes. Um, another source are bid tabs. So that's the past cost. And a lot of these from public entities are published. Um, and Google's a great way to search for these bid tabs. 
So an example of that, I would want to be very specific with what I'm looking for. I'd want to use the term bid tab, and I'd want to make sure those costs are recent and relevant. So if I was looking for a blower, um, and I knew the manufacturer, I would search for blower, the manufacturer, like um, ASREN, um, bid tab, 2018, Arizona. And I could do that for other components, like plug valve, bid tab, 2018, Arizona. Uh, I think an important thing is the cost for certain materials and construction in different locations is different. So you want to make sure it's relevant and also that it's recent. Here's an example of what a bid tab looks like. So this is for a project where they itemize the items on the left. They have quantity and units. And here are three bids provided by uh, contractors for the project. In this example, if I found an item on there that I wanted, um, I would capture the highest estimate provided, and I would still provide some um, conservancy with that. For example, the high bid for the overall project was $396,000 and change. I would call that $400,000. Something else we do in engineering and overall in the project is we would divide these components out by what's called different divisions. And the divisions refer back to the construction specifications um, as identified through the Construction Specification Institute. <clears throat> this helps you organize uh, your improvements by what section it would be in. And I'm gonna give you some examples here, but if there was uh, uh, work to grub and grade the site or to demo equipment, I would we'd put that in existing conditions. If you're creating new concrete, a basin, uh, a knockout, a new pad would be under concrete, new masonry site wall or masonry building would be under masonry, type of metals, that would just be um, supports, pads, stairs, handrails, that sort of thing. Um, openings would refer to maybe hatches, doorways. Um, and then Division 11 and Division 46, that's where we put uh, specific equipment, like a blower, a screen, a pump, something like that. Conveying equipment uh, could be such as a conveyor or uh, headworks or tailings. Um, mechanical is where you're going to put all your piping and valves. And then electrical and instrumentation. Uh, and I'm going to walk you through how we would populate that. There's some projects where the client is building a facility specific program, you may see uniformat as a specification format as opposed to CSI format. Uh, it's just a different organization for your estimate, a different organization for the specification information. But again, all the same information uh, gets conveyed from the designer to the contractor. That's very true. And we do see that a lot in federal contracts. All right, so here I've taken an example and populated into a table for this uh, estimate. So I have broken it out by division. I have the uh, items listed and numbered. I have the quantity, the units, and then here's the three most important columns, reading from left to right. First is the material cost, then the labor cost, and finally the equipment cost. Now this is per unit. So for example, on the first line under site work, I have to remove 30 horsepower mixers and support. And there's two of them. So uh, in the next column to the right, I develop the cost to remove each. So the material cost may be the physical material that I need. Um, could be concrete, chore work, um, uh, gravel, uh, something to do the work. Labor cost is that cost for the um, for the actual labor being completed, and then the equipment cost. So in this example, the cost I have in equipment is the cost I need for the small crane to move the mixer. So overall, uh, that develops a unit cost, and that unit cost is multiplied by the quantity. So if the unit cost is $4,500, the total is $9,000. So moving down through the estimate, uh, you can see under site work, I have a lot of remove, demo, some excavation, backfill, trenching, grading. In concrete, that's where I put slabs and basin walls. Uh, under five, I have some steel plates I want to add. Division nine is painting, so there's some coating that I want to do inside those basins. There's some specialties in this example. 
uh, where I put a shade structure or a weird, a weird gate. Next is equipment. So there I have uh, blowers, dissolved oxygen probes, um, moving down into mechanical. That's where I have piping, fittings, valves, aerators. And then under division 16 and 17, so there's electrical and instrumentation and control. And it's extremely difficult, even at you know, uh, you know, 30 or 50 percent through a design to develop those costs. And electrical and instrumentation control can end up being a large portion of your overall project. So for this uh, project and approach, uh, we would recommend using a percentage. So for electrical, we recommend 30 percent of all of the divisions uh, above it, and the instrumentation would be 15 percent of, of all of the <clears throat> uh, divisions above it. So overall, that comes down to a subtotal, line A, divisions 2 through 17. That's the cost to deliver the project in the field. Now, below it are probably the most important items that you need and want to add into your estimate. So first, some of those items above are taxable. Uh, but for a conceptual rough order of magnitude estimate, we're going to say it's all taxable and add the specific tax for it. Now you'll want to look up the specific tax for the location of your property and plug that in. Next, we have uh, mobilization, demobilization. That's the cost to get equipment to and from the site and for the contractor to stage uh, to do the work. Um, based on the estimate, uh, the proper range, uh, you can see in the column on the right, I list some ranges for you to consider, and then in this project, I chose one, 1%. 1 there should be some cost for construction survey. It's also construction overhead. Um, there's uh, specific permitting. Now, that could be through the city, county, or state agency. There's engineering, construction, administration, and inspection. So, you know, typically third-party engineering oversight during construction ranges from 1% to 5%. There's developing construction as built, the record drawing and the O&M. That can be between one and a half to three percent of the project. Um, the startup and commissioning, which is probably the most important part of the project. Uh, definitely want to make sure you allocate additional time into just uh, building and delivering the project, but starting it up and training the staff. Uh, next, item J through M, some of the soft cost in there. First is the engineering design. It has to be designed before it's delivered. That ranges 8 to 18 percent. There's the design permitting that needs to be done. There's the bidding and the procurement to be able to deliver the project. And finally, the legal and administration um, for the project. So all those items, B through M, are added to A. Um, and then a contingency supplied. And I think I gave you the range between 20 and 35%. And in this example, I show 20% contingency to cover those unknowns and unforeseeables and to come up with an overall total under line O. And with that, I'll turn it over to Darren to share his perspective. All right. From a contractor's perspective with conceptual estimates, these are just a, just a quick summary of things to keep in mind. Uh, first and foremost, being thorough and accurate with your conceptual estimates is key to your budget certainty. We mentioned thorough and accuracy or thoroughness and accuracy here, but not preciseness. In other words, don't take yourself down a rabbit hole where you're trying to figure out exactly uh, how something, how much something costs, or exactly how to put something together. Spending that time during the conceptual estimate will waste the time you need to spend on figuring your project out or making sure that you have everything in the estimate. You should be spending more time brainstorming your estimate and the organization of it than you spend trying to find precisely how much something costs down to the penny or down to the hundred, hundreds of dollars. The second component here is historical productivity is it must be relevant for you to use. What I mean there is uh, in construction, a lot of the, the numbers, a lot of the dollars that contribute to our estimate, you saw it in Frederick's example, the unit prices, those unit prices are driven by historical productivity information or past costs, we call it. Yet there is a caveat with the use of past costs, and that's making sure that the project that those past costs come from is relevant with respect to size, complexity, and location. Building a 3MGD plant in Las Vegas is going to cost you something totally different than a 3MGD plant in Luling, Texas. 
So be careful with those historic productivity numbers that you use. Make sure that they are relevant. And if they aren't relevant, make sure you're adjusting to, to account for the complexity or the location or the size of the facility you're building. Organization in your estimate is key to assuring that you have captured it all. And, and Frederick gave you some really good organization examples to organize your estimate. Uh, like I said in the first bullet there, brainstorming the estimate and the organization of the estimate will make sure or help to ensure that you have everything accounted for. It's almost more important to have a thorough estimate with a great organization than it is to have the right number. When the estimate's thorough and it's well organized, as you progress from this conceptual estimate phase all the way down to the detailed bidding phase, you have a greater chance of having an accurate number when you've sat and you've taken the time to organize and brainstorm your estimate properly. One bullet I, I don't mention on this slide is indirect costs. Frederick talked about it earlier, how indirect is a significant percentage of your work. Don't just think about the direct cost of your project. There's lots of projects where the direct cost of the job were not significant, but the indirect cost of the job, permits, people, people are the biggest components of those, the indirect costs, where the indirect cost of the job far outpaced the direct cost. You can expect indirect costs of projects to be north of 20 to 30%, depending upon how complex your project is. So don't, excuse me, don't overlook the indirect costs on your project. Just like Frederick did earlier in organizing uh, the estimate into major systems, I did the same to explain the contractor's approach. I organized the contractor's approach notes into major systems. The first major system on any construction project typically is the civil and site work component. So let's spend some time talking about the civil and site work focus items. In civil and site work, I broke it down to specification review, quantity takeoff, pricing, subcontractors, and additional design build considerations. Starting with specifications, one of the first and most important things to think about is what are you doing to the site surface? Are there requirements for topsoil removal you need to think about? Uh, in some areas of the world, you can't just remove the material from the top and dispose of it. It may end up being contaminated or may contain too many organics, and you may have to send that information to a dump site. So pay close attention in your specification review to what you need to do with the topsoil material. If your site is surrounded by a, a residential community, there may be noise or vibration mitigation requirements that you will have to put into practice before or as you begin construction. These special considerations can severely impact your pricing, especially if you're doing something like rock ripping or blasting. So pay close attention to those noise and vibration mitigation requirements. Last, how's the subsurface on the site? If the subsoil contain sand and gravel, you will practice different compaction techniques than you do if your subsoils contain a lot of clays. Your specifications will outline all of that information I just went over, so pay close attention to your specs and some of those things that your specs may mention. Moving to taking off your quantity, what we call quantifying the job, we call takeoff. That takeoff is, is the basis of your estimate, counting numbers of eaches or cubic yards of quantity that's the basis of any good estimate. One of the things that I pay close attention to on a civil site work estimate is will the site balance? In other words, will the number of cubic yards I need to remove from the site equal the number of cubic yards that I am bringing to the site? In a perfect world, you don't wanna export anything more than you have to. So if you're taking the topsoil off of the site, you wanna be able to reuse as much of that dirt as you can and not have to haul the material off. It never works that way though in my practice. So taking a good analysis of how much material needs to be removed and how much material needs to be brought to site is your first challenge with your quantity takeoff for civil and site work. Next, we develop what we call a dirt flow plan. That's our plan to tell us where we're gonna stockpile the material we are keeping on site, how we develop haul route access on the site, and how do we minimize touching the same earth twice. A perfect dirt flow plan has an organized location for stockpile, has easy gate access onto and out of the site, and has a good plan for haul routes around the site for trucks or other material, other equipment that we're gonna to use to move dirt. 
if you seem if in your estimate or in your quantity takeoff you you appear to be putting material in the same place where you're going to be needing to excavate that material that's earth that we call that's a, sorry that's something we call touching material twice we don't like to touch anything twice so make sure your quantity and your plan shows where that material can be staged and stored so you don't have to touch that material twice last but not least on your quality quantity takeoff Google Earth can be a friend of yours when it comes to conceptual estimate for a site. Google Earth can get you very close, believe it or not, to helping quantify the, a cubic yard estimate for quantity takeoff. Uh, it allows you to zoom into sites. You can get a good idea of the uh, topsoil condition or the top strata condition of the earth around the site. You can also do some vertical and horizontal elevation takeoff so you can determine exactly how many yards there are material on your site. So utilize some of those elements, uh, electronic elements, to do your takeoff without having to go to the site and do an actual takeoff. Moving from takeoff into pricing, uh, pricing being that next step in development of your estimate, your conceptual estimate, keep in mind, if you've built similar projects before, this concept of past costs or bid tabs, find some similar projects with similar soil characteristics in order to use for bid tabs. Uh, those resources that Frederick brought up earlier are great resources to determine how earth must be moved or how you price earth moving in different areas. Again, keep in mind where you're doing the work. Utah is vastly different than moving dirt in Texas. So keep those things in mind as you're developing your pricing and utilizing those resources you were given. Another component of pricing is what are you using to haul equipment and is that equipment available? A scraper may be readily available in Texas, but is probably not going to be available in uh, inner city New York. Make sure that the piece of equipment that you're using for that work is readily available and can be used in that region for doing the work that you're looking for. Also, when you're talking about equipment, you need to keep in mind mobilization costs need to be considered in your estimate. Sometimes the price to mobilize equipment can be 10, 15, 20% of the overall rental cost of that equipment or on an annual basis. Uh, we found that on some of our projects, mobilization costs have kept us from utilizing a piece of equipment sparingly. If it's gonna cost you an inordinate amount to mobilize a piece of equipment from across the country, rather than use a smaller piece of equipment that you can get locally, you're gonna to wanna to consider that local smaller piece of equipment in your productions and in your pricing. One last component about pricing for civil and site work that I want to highlight is water. Water is used in compaction. Water is used in dust control. Water is a critical component for civil and site work construction. So one, determine if there's a nearby water source that you can use and draw from, and what is the cost per million gallons to utilize that water source. Another thing often overlooked in that pricing is, are you storing that water nearby in ponds? Are you bringing in a tank, what's called a Klein tank, to store that water on site? Or can you use reclaimed water from the plant you're working on for compaction or for, uh, for dust control water? Subcontractors and suppliers are frequently overlooked in our civil and site work estimates. A lot of times we believe those suppliers and subcontractors are pretty interchangeable, that we can utilize them uh, when we need them. But you do need to keep in mind those suppliers are key and critical to you delivering the project and delivering an accurate estimate. One aspect of subcontractors that's critical in, in civil work is trucking. Trucking subcontractor rates can vary wildly from one to another one. Um, searching your bid tab resources for a good trucking contractor and putting good, reliable numbers into your estimate for trucking contractors, including some escalation for commodities like fuel uh, or aggregates, is wise and important in your subcontractor numbers. Of course, there are other subs that you will need to consider, but trucking is one that our company in specific has had lots and lots of challenges with getting the right numbers early on in the conceptual estimating process so we don't leave anything out. Some additional considerations for design build to think about with civil projects. Contingency on site work is your friend. You need to know that you don't know everything with respect to civil and site work and without doing a detailed evaluation of the site, the civil and site work dollars can vary wildly. So if you're making assumptions, make those assumptions, list them, and weigh those risks on your contingency register 
and make sure that you're carrying some contingency for the things that you just don't know about your site. Moving to the next major system on a water wastewater plant, structures is a major focus on most water and wastewater projects. Again, I broke the structures focus items down to spec review, quantity takeoff, pricing, sub, and design build considerations. Starting with specifications, again, one of the most important components of a specification for structures is the concrete strength and admixture requirements. Water and wastewater facilities typically have some of the most diverse concrete you're gonna find in construction. By diverse, I mean they contain different concrete admixtures, specific influent and effluent at the plant will dictate what those admixtures are, whether you need air content, or excuse me, air that needs to be included in the concrete, uh, air sometimes improves the workability of concrete. There may be different admixtures that need to be included in that concrete mix design that are non-typical. So pay close attention in your specifications for those admixtures. Uh, they can increase the price of your concrete substantially uh, if you don't understand what those admixtures are. Sticking to the concrete specifications, cold and hot weather requirements for concrete will also be listed in your specifications. Things like Concrete temperatures for curing, wet curing versus chemical curing, and whether wet curing is allowed over chemical curing. In warm weather places like Arizona, how much ice can you add to the concrete without impacting the water cement ratio? Those things need to be closely examined out of the specifications uh, during your conceptual estimate because they can vary the price of your concrete. Last, with respect to the specs, are there external finish requirements for walls or slabs that need to be incorporated into your price? By that, I mean in some construction cases and construct, some construction specifications, there are finish requirements for some of the vertical elements that are tough to attain, that require detailed finishing, that may impact the price of that concrete. So when you look at some of your vertical concrete and you're thinking it should be in the realm of five to $700 a cubic yard, paying attention to some of those vertical uh, concrete external finish requirements can increase the cost of those concrete walls or vertical concrete elements two to three hundred dollars per cubic yard. Moving on to your takeoff for structures. Structures take off again as the basis of any good estimate. If it's at all possible for you to build a model of the facility, I'd highly encourage you to do so. Uh, maybe you will be provided with some sort of model by your sponsors for this project. Models help you to define conflicts and structures very easily. So understanding what's going on all around the concrete structure can severely impact the takeoff and show you what elements are gonna be harder to build versus easier to build. Also getting to know the intent of the structure while you're doing the takeoff can help you. Sometimes certain elements aren't shown in conceptual design. For instance, if you're building a sludge basin or sludge tank, there may not be a detailed design of the sump that in, that's incorporated with that tank. But understanding that you're building a sludge tank and that every sludge tank needs to have a sump that's associated with it uh, will help you if you do that thorough, if you have that thorough understanding of the intent of the structures that you're taking off. So spend that time early on to understand exactly what it is you're building. Moving to pricing of structural items. With structures, the most important component of structures is the access for cranes and access for equipment and laydown. Every vertical structure is gonna require some type of formwork and that formwork uh, typically is pretty detailed. You need an area in and around where you're going to build that structure as laydown. And also included near that laydown area, you're gonna to need to access that laydown site with a crane or some type of a hoisting device. Keep yourself an area uh, sorry, including your pricing, an area to build that laydown and an area for that crane to be able to work around the formwork, work around the vertical element so you can get it erected. Also, another component in your pricing of structures that I find often gets left out is understanding that repetition of the same detail makes for more economical construction. So if you've got a, an area with walls and, and you wanna cut those walls up in your pricing to the same length, that way you can build the same formwork and reuse the same formwork to build future stretches of wall. Don't just take a 100 foot long wall and expect that you're gonna build two sides of 100 foot long wall formwork. If it takes you too long to build that 100 foot of wall, 
you, when you could break it down into 20 foot sections and reuse and recycle those same 20 foot stretches of forms uh, to build that, that same stretch of wall. That repetition for your team will make that construction more economical. The more homogenous the wall, the more simple the wall, the better that, that wall formwork system is and the, and the more efficient the pricing will be. Again, moving to subcontractors. Subcontractors can be a large percentage, subs and suppliers can be a large percentage of your structure's estimate. Uh, today, the availability of concrete is definitely something that we think about when pricing our structure's work. Uh, we found our concrete suppliers are getting busier and busier. Uh, we found variations in pricing uh, to be 10, 20% of the overall price of concrete. Another thing to think about when you're choosing a concrete supplier or choosing subcontractors for your structures work is availability. We're finding concrete suppliers cannot deliver material within an hour of, uh, of, of the times that we're requesting it. So making sure you're researching those suppliers finding on-time performance information as best you can and, and incorporating that into your estimate uh, is very important. A few additional considerations to think about from a contractor's perspective with structures. Uh, if you are improvising on the provided design, make sure you know where you're improvising on the provided design and include costs in your risk register for what happens if your improvisation gets rejected by the engineer. In other words, if you are changing the wall dim dimension slightly or you're taking advantage of uh, building a different footing because you can excavate it differently and you can build it differently in the field, those ideas don't always get accepted by the engineer. So knowing when you are improvising on a provided design from a design build perspective, uh, it may give you an advantage in your price, but it may cost you in the long run when you have to go back and change those, uh, those improvisations later. The last system uh, I wanted to highlight today is process mechanical. Uh, process mechanical, piping, joints, those kinds of things are very important to any water and wastewater project. Again, I focused on specification, quantity takeoff, uh, and the associated elements there. Jumping into specifications, most important there is your understanding of the pipe materials, joint type, coding requirements, et cetera, explained in the specifications. They, the specifications can get as detailed as in the conceptual estimate phase, or they could be very uh, generic. But figuring out some of the, the, the base level information, like what materials, what joints you have there, what butt, bolt and nut gasket, excuse me, bolt, nut, and gasket types are required, that base level information can drive your overall pricing with respect to process mechanical in general. The material pricing of process mechanical can outpace the labor by 20, 30 percent. So be careful on what you're getting from the specifications and make sure you're choosing uh, the information wisely, the pipe material and information that's given to you. Another component outlined in the specification is if the project is funded uh, by federal funding, there may be Buy America or Buy American provisions that require you to buy American iron and steel products. Uh, again, those elements shown in the specifications can be easily overlooked and can definitely impact your price. Moving to quantity takeoff, accounting for some of the ancillary elements of quantity takeoff is important. If you're building in a seismic area and you don't have an accurate accounting of your pipe straps or pipe supports and hangers or structural steel needed to support piping, the conceptual design may not spell out those pipe supports or the hangers or structural steel needed for them. So pay close attention to the notes on the drawings that talk about those ancillary elements of piping that can be easily overlooked in your quantity takeoff. Make sure you're accounting for them early in the takeoff so you don't forget them later as the design progresses. Also, one component I say that my 12-year-old daughter can get right when it comes to quantity takeoff of process mechanical is coloring up your drawings to ensure that no items are missed. It's very easy to miss lineal footage of pipe when you when you attempt to take it off as a black line on a white sheet of paper, taking out your color pencils and making sure you're coloring and know when that yellow line goes from one side of the page and continues to the piece of equipment on the other side of the page, ensuring you've got every lineal foot of that particular line counted and that you only count it one time is very important to your quantity takeoff. Moving into pricing, 
one thing that we we are looking to improve upon in our conceptual estimate pricing is what a startup of the system look like uh, startup of the system can be can be implemented over several months in our construction process and not paying enough attention to that at the pricing phase could get your estimate out of whack it may not take very long to install a piece of complex equipment but pay close attention to the labor cost associated with startup and commissioning and the number of individual trades involved with startup and commissioning when you're putting together your pricing. Uh, it may not be inherent to understand that if you're installing a chlorine scrubber, uh, that chlorine scrubber expands or that chlorine scrubber extends across at least four different disciplines. You need a concrete pad structure for the piece of equipment to sit on. You need process mechanical uh, and pipe fitters to attach parts and pieces to that chlorine scrubber. You need HVAC professionals for the air evacuation processes of the chlorine scrubber. And you need electricians to tie in the electrical to the chlorine scrubber and the controls uh, back to the overall plant controls. So spend a lot of time understanding what those startup roles look like with respect to your process mechanical and your specialty equipment. Also in pricing is with, with respect to some of these plants, you may be doing rehabilitation of an existing plant. What is the condition of the material you're tying into? The age and the quality of that material will change your approach as you may have to do certain things to make sure that that material you're tying into is sound enough uh, for you to attach to. So pay close attention to the age, uh, the condition, um, the suitability of those materials before you assume that you can just tie into them and not have to worry about it. Going into subcontractors and suppliers again, uh, some areas that we overlook quite frequently in our water wastewater estimates are back T subcontractors, so bacterial testing contractors, pressure testing subcontractors, weld testing subcontractors, uh, and startup and commissioning professionals. Those are some areas that often get overlooked both in the estimates and in, in, in selecting the quality subcontractors and suppliers to utilize in the field. Pay close attention to those folks as they really, uh, they're typically at the back end of the installation process, but they can add several days, weeks, and months to your project if not done correctly. And last, some additional design build considerations to take into account. Um, with the mechanical project, I've got 50 bullets on my page here outlining things from sump pumps and piping to vents and high points. Uh, safety eyewash stations and sunshades for instruments, all of those things can go into designs that may not be shown at the conceptual estimate phase. No one understand that every conceptual design won't show you all the components that your estimate needs to have in it, but pay some attention or do some research with the resources that Frederick gave you to make sure you have included in your estimate enough for those additional ancillary items that go into a mechanic, go into a water wastewater plant. Great, thank you, Darren. There was a lot of great information in there, specifically about uh, items that you should consider as developing your presentation. <clears throat> and here are some of our conclusions and takeaways from it. First, I think we both mentioned, it's important to take the time to demonstrate your understanding of what you've heard here today in your estimate, uh, to include materials, labor, site civil work, transport, phasing, source requirements, uh, testing, startup, and lay down and staging requirements. Now keep in mind, you may not be able to identify how to include that in your estimate, uh, but it's important that you acknowledge that in being thorough in your estimate. So your estimate itself, um, you may also include uh, in your report um, a narrative that explains your understanding and approach to how you organize it, what is included in that number, and things you assumed. Um, as you know, engineers and contractors, we have to make assumptions every day. And the important thing is that we're communicating those assumptions, we're writing them down, so that later through the project, as you get more specific information, you can go back and update those assumptions. Uh, second, be as complete as you can in your line item of the estimates. Uh, three, be systematic, uh, right? And organized mind and approach will help you get through this uh, as quickly and easily as possible. So start at that system or process level and then go component by component down. And remember uh, line items B through O in that estimate of things you want to include. List your references as you go. 
Um, it's important that you're able to recreate that information if called upon, and you might find uh, better information to use along the way. Fifth, state your approach to estimating in the report. And finally, start early and finish on time. So overall, estimating is an exercise to project the cost slightly above the anticipated cost to deliver. Right? This is a budgetary estimate. As Darren said, it's not going to have everything in it, and it's more important to be complete than accurate. Um, there's going to be a lot of variances, which is uh, in cost, but also in unknowns, and that's what contingency in, is for. And the proper standard of care is required to maintain confidence that the estimate is not overly aggressive and does not include errors or omissions that could prevent the project from proceeding. As this is going to be a tool that you use to uh, potentially make decisions on what alternatives you recommend and then to demonstrate the project is feasible. With that, I'd love to thank Darren for uh, taking the time to develop the presentation and share his insights. We've included our email addresses at the end. If you were to have questions, um, you are welcome to try and reach out to us. Uh, we'd be glad to try and help. Absolutely. Thanks for your time, everybody. Appreciate you listening. Thanks, Frederick, for the opportunity. Yeah, thank you.